Hi, this is radioactive, but I don't know what makes it radioactive. It is not behaving like any other source I have tested. In this video, I'll try to figure out which element radioisotope is hiding in it, using a range of tests, including magnets to test for any charged particles in the radiation, and if so, whether their charge is positive or negative. I will even use a gamma spectrometer to get a picture of any extreme electromagnetic radiation coming from the source. Will we figure it out, or will the source remain a mystery? Only handle radioactive samples if you know what you are doing. And be careful near strong neodymium magnets, don't let them bite you. I have received this mystery source from a viewer. As I understand it, he extracted it from an old electrometer amplifier that had three radioactive sources of different strengths. They could be used to generate constant currents for checking and calibrating the display of the instrument. However, besides the little warning sticker with the tree foil for ionizing radiation, there was no info about the nature of the sources on the instrument. I simply don't know what makes this radioactive. Is it uranium, thorium, radium, americium, or a new radio element I haven't encountered before? Time to find out. First test is just to see if it is radioactive at all. For this, I will use my Gamma Scout Geiger counter that, despite its name, will detect all three main types of ionizing radiation. Alpha, Beta and Gamma. Here on the back near the mounting screw, I am not detecting anything above normal background radiation. On the side, I am still not detecting anything unusual. Is it radioactive at all? Oh yeah, on the front there is some ionizing radiation setting off the Geiger tube. This is the first small clue. Since the plastic seems to be enough to shield the radiation, there's not much gamma radiation coming from this source. High energy gamma radiation would easily pass through that thin plastic. The source must primarily be an alpha or beta emitter. Let's narrow it down further. The Gamma Scout has some built-in shields for blocking alpha and beta radiation. With no shielding, it is measuring around 26 microsieverts an hour. With the alpha shield engaged, it drops to around 15. This tells us that the source is not a pure alpha emitter. A large amount is still coming through the alpha shield. The blocked part could be alpha particles, but it could also be low energy beta particles, since all beta emitters have a wide energy spectrum all the way down to easily blocked energies. Now for the shield that would only let the hardest of betas and most gamma radiation pass. Around 0.2 microsieverts an hour, so very little is coming through. Little to no gamma radiation is coming from it. I would like to test more precisely with four more shields. Paper is enough to block alphas, but it does next to nothing to this source. Same story with alufoil. Definitely not alphas. An alu sheet is enough to block most of the radiation. Again indicating most of it is beta particles, not gamma. With a figure alu sheet, we are down to background radiation, so next to no gamma radiation from the source. Alright, the penetration tests indicate that we are dealing with an almost pure beta emitter. That's interesting, since I don't have any other sources that are this limited to just beta emission. It is not uranium, thorium, radium or americium. But is this really beta radiation, or just very weak gamma radiation, or X-rays? There is a way of telling them apart. Charged particles such as beta radiation, which is basically electrons or positrons, are deflected when they pass through a magnetic field. 
Gamma radiation and X-rays, on the other hand, are not charged particles. They are electromagnetic radiation, like light, and are not bent by a magnet. Let me build a small rig with magnets that will separate charged particles and electromagnetic radiation from each other. This will have to be an open, less sturdy and less safe rig compared to the one I built in a previous video. Otherwise, the rig itself will be in the way for the incoming or deflected particles. Remember, never put your fingers between two neodymium magnets. They will bite hard. There we have it. With two onlight poles facing each other, the magnetic field lines are highly parallel between the magnets. Perfect for deflecting charged particles predictably. Let's try it. Without the magnets nearby, I am measuring 0.4 microsieverts an hour. Around three times the average background radiation in my home, so some radiation from the source is hitting the Geiger tube. Now I'll add the magnets with north poles facing up. Okay. The radiation is almost gone. Looks like the magnets are deflecting the radiation away from the Geiger counter. Let me reverse the magnetic polarity to north poles facing down. Oh wow! That made a huge difference. The magnets are clearly deflecting some of the radiation towards the Geiger counter now. Not only does this deflection tell us that the source is sending out charged particles, the direction of the deflection even shows us which electric charge the particles have. We can use the left hand rule to determine whether the particles have a negative or positive electric charge. I explained the rule in details in an earlier video if you want to learn more about it. But in short, by pointing my left hand's index finger in the direction the north poles were pointing, and my thumb in the direction of the deflection, my middle finger is now pointing in the direction of the conventional current. The direction in which positive particles would have traveled into the magnetic field. But we know the particles move into the field in the opposite direction. So they must have a negative charge. The source is emitting electrons, also known as beta minus radiation. It is not particles with a positive charge like alpha or beta plus radiation. Nice! Beta minus radiation is confirmed. But I haven't really ruled out any weak gamma radiation or X-rays yet. The issue with all Geiger counters is that they aren't very smart. They can't measure the energy of each single ionizing radiation hitting them. Time to go more modern and smart with a gamma spectrometer that will tell us about the energy of each hit, right after a short but important message. A huge thank you to all my patrons. I appreciate your help with keeping these videos like this one coming. For just a dollar a month, you can help me out too and get full access to all my posts on patreon.com. Link in the description. Thank you. Alright, RadiaCode has sent me their latest creation, the RadiaCode 103. An improved version of the 101 I used to identify cesium-137 in some mushrooms two years ago. This does not use a Geiger-Müller tube like all Geiger counters. Instead, it uses a scintillation crystal that gives off a tiny flash of light when hit by ionizing gamma or X-ray radiation. The clever part being, the stronger the ionizing photon, the brighter the flash of light in the crystal. By measuring the flashes, this tiny instrument can tell us about the energy of each ionizing photon. And many radioactive isotopes have distinct gamma energies making it possible to identify the exact radioisotope, something even the most expensive Geiger counters can't. Yet, 
This improved 103 is still more affordable than the Gamma Scout. The major improvement in the 103 version is a four times larger photomultiplier, making it even better at measuring the light flashes. This will easily show us if the source is sending out any gamma or X-ray radiation. Let's find out now. It went from around 3 counts per second to around 15. It is picking something up from this beta minus emitter. I will give it half an hour to accumulate a spectrum. Should be enough for this relatively strong source. There we have it. Hmm, looks a lot like normal background radiation. No major peaks, except for two at the very low end. With this spectrum, I can finally rule out a lot of radioisotopes. For example, the beta emitting cobalt-60. None of its signature peaks are in the spectrum. The twin peaks at the low end could at first glance look like a little emerson 241 contamination, but I'm pretty sure it isn't. First off, the peaks are not centered at the right energies, and the lowest energy peak is taller than the peak at higher energy. Let me show you how the gamma spectrum from americium 241 really looks like. I am still surprised by how well the radio code picks up the weak gamma radiation from americium, a radio element that many people only know as an alpha emitter. This spectrum is quite different from the one before. Notice how the higher energy peak is much taller than the lower energy one. I must admit, I didn't follow the good gamma spectroscopy practice of calibrating the instrument before the measurement. The calibration seems to be 5 kilo electron volts off at this very low end. Not much in a gamma world of hundreds or thousands of kilo electron volts. But by using this measurement from a known radioisotope as calibration, I now know that the two peaks from the source are centered at 15 and 45 kilo electron volts. From the energies and distribution of peak heights, we can tell this is not a Mauritium 241. I believe the two peaks are from Bremsstrahlung, X-rays generated by the electrons of the beta minus emission hitting the metal in the source. The two separate peaks could indicate that the beta emission is split into two different energy ranges. Interesting. Let me just sum up the observations I have collected to identify the mystery radioisotope. Pause the video if you want to read all details. Okay, with all of these observations combined, I believe the radioactive part of the mystery source is strontium-90. It fits well with all observations, but maybe there's another radioisotope I have missed. Comment with any input you might have. Until I get my hands on a beta spectrometer, there is still a bit of mystery left in this source. Hope you enjoyed this video enough to click like and perhaps subscribe for more like it. In any case, thanks for watching. Bye for now.